This is Rob Peary with the Coffee Runs Deep podcast, where we interview coffee farmers, coffee roasters, and we share their stories. I truly hope you enjoy the experience. What's going on, everybody? We have two guests from California on the show today, Matt Rosenblum and Misha Mansoor. They own and operate Golden Lantern Coffee Roasters in Orange County. We talk about everything from roaster purchasing issues to building out a tasting room, how their partnership works, and their journey from touring the world to starting a coffee roastery. These dudes pack a ton of experience, so I know you're going to get some great advice out of this episode. Hope you enjoy. Welcome to the Coffee Runs Deep podcast. I'm your host, Rob Peary. And today we have two special guests on, Matt and Misha, with Golden Lantern Coffee Roasters out of Laguna Hills, California. So Matt, Misha, how y'all doing today? We're doing good. Good, Rob. Thanks for having us. Golden Lantern Coffee Roasters, what's the meaning behind the name? I'm kind of curious behind that right off the start. <laughs> um, you know, it's not the, there's not the craziest story to be completely transparent and honest. Uh, when we were thinking about names, you know, I was riddling over probably a list of a, we had a list of a hundred different names and, you know, you want something that means something to you that's kind of special, but still unique. And I mean, you could take classes on how to properly name your business, uh, you know, on all, on all accounts. And what I noticed in coffee is there were so many phrases that were just overused and overdone. Yeah. They're all taken Uh, too. (laughs) Well, that's the other thing. As soon as you (laughs) put it in the like. (laughs) <laughs> oh my god yeah it's like oh well, that one's taken we you know we probably narrowed down 100 to 30 to 10 and then those ones were all taken and uh i thought of it one day you know i i do like location based names you know that kind of uh uh symbolize like where you are and what your you know your community is and down here we've got a street called the golden lantern that runs you know for miles it goes through a couple towns uh starts at the lantern district down in dana point and I live off of it up in the Laguna Niguel side. And it was kind of like, uh, you can take like the highway to get up and down, but I always took Golden Lantern because it was like the, lo- the road less traveled, you know? And uh, we were trying to come up with a name and I was sitting at, you know, the intersection, just looking at the sign. And uh, I just kind of like got this, this, this vision for like a, you know, a symbol, some symbology on it. I don't know, maybe you had an epiphany or whatnot. And what's funny is we, we used it and I said, okay, we're going to be golden lantern coffee roasters. You know, it's got like this, this nice bright, you know, feel to it. It's got a good, uh, uh, you know, we could, we could pair a logo with that where you can just see the symbol and recognize what it is. Uh, one day we love to have a retail shop off of golden lantern. So that's fitting. But at the same time, you know, when I was pitching it around to people for suggestions, everyone was like, yeah, you know, it's like a little too long. It might be, you know, unmemorable this, that, or the other. And when me and Misha started the company, I said, okay, we'll just keep it as a placeholder until, you know, we think of something better. And that just never happened. And now I'm too attached to to change. Yeah, we still haven't thought of anything better. And it's it's a lesson learned. (laughs) We had all these great ideas. They're all taken. They're all trademarked. It's all his. And it's like, you know what? It's not that bad a name. And and I have this theory. You'll, You'll get this with bands all the time where like, you know, you love a band and you don't realize like, kind of how dumb the band name actually is because you love it and i'm like and, and i eventually i think we just realized like the name doesn't actually matter that much like the product is good people are talking about it why rebrand um and it kind of proves that point you know you could have like i've always said like tool is a really stupid band name but it doesn't matter Dude, like, th- very- yeah, like a bunch like matchbox 20 and the right. goo dolls like <laughs> what the heck like- yeah exactly no that's exactly what i'm talking yeah. about right you don't even think about it because you associate it with this like established thing so i think what's happened is we've we've crossed over to the other side we're established enough where it's like doesn't really matter what it's called and now i kind of like that is lo- it's location based you know i've driven on gold golden lantern a bunch of times it's a pretty oh, beautiful yeah. area yeah. it's like cool i'm down <clears throat> so, you know, we, we, I went as far as to even reach out, you know, when you get real serious and you're trying to get like all business savvy, um, to some, you know, some people in like, um, what is it? Market research and product development and everything. And even like the suggestions that they come up with, they're like, uh, what about like bloom bean roast mat? Yeah. And it's just the stupidest stuff. And you're like, man, it's just gotta, you know, it's the, your name has to mean something to you. And I always thought you need some kind of like symbology to go along with it. And my thought was always, you know, I want people to eventually see the lamp, like kind of like blue bottle now, like I want people to see the lantern and know, uh, know what it is automatically. Heck yeah, dude. 
No, that's pretty cool. And I, I, I kind of, I feel the same way. Like the name, the name is really what you make it in the end. If you have a quality product, if you push and get your, you know, name out there, the, you know, the product out there, it's kind of going to, it's going to make the name stand out. I, Cause I mean, I think about a lot of time, like what's a Google, you know, what's Apple, like yeah. they literally took weird names in a, in a fruit and made it something that's com- <laughs> you think completely different about it, you know? So, so how did y'all meet and what's y'all's like kind of partnership deal? Uh, so yeah, you tell it, you tell okay, it. I'll tell it. Yes. <laughs> so Bisha and I have been working together, uh, for the better part of a decade now, and we actually met in live music, uh, and we formed, you know, this working relationship, which turned into this friendship and kind of, you know, brotherhood where we spent, uh, you know, a decade just traveling the world, putting on, uh, you know, putting on concerts and kind of just, you know, doing what we loved. And when the pandemic hit, uh, I was, you know, in the unfortunate position to lose my job. And uh, my wife's in the same industry. So we were both kind of like, you know, ready to make this pivot because we didn't know what was going to happen. And our son had just been born in March of 2020. So, you know, uh, kind of not to say we took a leap of faith, but, you know, coffee was always that thing. My other background was always in the restaurant industry. Uh, you know, I've held every job from, you know, a prep cook to a waiter, to a bartender, to a sous chef, um, you know, and I, I was always fascinated with coffee and that was kind of an interest me and Misha shared as enthusiasts all these years. Um, so, you know, in our travels, like the ritual, literally the ritual of the day was like, Hey, let's, you know, find the best coffee in any given city, you know, whether we're in Australia or Southeast Asia or South America or Europe, it's where can we go to get, you know, the best cup of coffee and sometimes multiple places a day. If you're in a city, it's like, Hey, let's, you know, I'm going to get it for breakfast, you know, lunch. And then that last one in the afternoon, you know, so uh, we kind of had that, that relationship, that bond going on. And I started roasting coffee, uh, basically out of my kitchen and then out of my garage, uh, kind of just as a hobbyist trying to learn. Um, and you know, I was sending batches to all friends and family and Misha was one of the people I was always giving coffee to. And, uh, you know, he will tell you, he's brutally honest with his opinion of it. And a lot of it was not good at that time. You know, you've, you've roasted in a, a small, oh, yeah. you know how it is when you first start, man, like some of those, you just got to learn, you got to learn. Yeah. And I always took that, that, you know, that uh, methodology of like, Hey, if you want to learn something like put in the time, like do it, learn it, uh, master it, you know? So hundreds of batches later, you know, and I was still uh, dead set on growing this company and uh misha kind of got my vision he you know he he enjoyed some of the coffee he kind of saw what i was doing um you know he he got it you know he was one of the the few people to be like i see what you're doing and i like it and i believe in it and uh you know from there i was a sole prop at the time and we decided to kind of join forces here and you know officially launch golden lantern coffee roasters and uh, i don't know do i leave anything out misha you want to touch on no i mean that's that's basically it from my perspective it's it's one of those things where, where it's a, it's a leap of faith on my end, you know, if I'm going to invest in this, cause there's no data, there's nothing to really say that anything's going to be anything. So you're, you're really just going from, well, I've known Rosie long enough. I was like, well, I know your personality. He's one of the hardest working dudes. I know he's a really good dude and, uh, and a very pleasant guy to, to be around and work with. So I'm like, okay, working relationships going to be great. And I know that we can put the work. In. I know that he can put the work in cause I've seen him do it over the last decade. So it's like, uh, I believe, I believed in his talent. And I think as we all know, it takes a combination of everything. Can't just have talent. You got to have like the whole package. I saw, I saw this as like the whole package. I could sort of be the other end of that. And I felt like between the two of us, you know, I don't, I don't need data. I felt like this, this is something that will be fun. Something I'm passionate about. And it's going to be kind of ex- exciting to see where we can go with this. Also, I mean, one thing that that's fair to mention is like, I, I feel like to some degree, we weren't really starting from zero because we had so many contacts. God, on tour, if you knew the amount of coffee that's consumed of, of varying levels of quality, but like, we already had like a lot of sort of open doors for collaborations and for, for people to, to tell about it that would be excited about it. So I felt like we weren't entirely starting from zero. And, uh, and it just it just seemed like a fun thing to kind of jump into. And, you know, if, if it doesn't work out, then I feel like we could, could just be like, Hey, we gave it our best shot. Like, Uh, I know that it wasn't like a lack of hard work. That wasn't, was the reason why this didn't work out, you know? 
I do want to, to give one person a shout out that Misha and I have both, you know, had the pleasure of uh, having a long lasting friendship and, and traveling with is uh, Paul Wagner, who oh, is, a, is a roast master um, for Night Flyer in um, North Carolina, out of Charlotte, North Carolina. He was kind of like the guy, you know, every day to, to you know, I was the dude who literally would bring around a big Folgers tin in my backpack and like brew it wherever I could. And here I am, like, we're, you know, living and working every day with this roast master. And he was the one, like, I'd see him like making an air press on the bus. And I'm like, whoa, what is that? Like, what are you doing? You know? And he would always bring his fresh roasted coffee on tour. And it kind of like, you know, traveling with him kind of gave me a light bulb because every day it's like, here's this, this mentor in the industry who's going to, you know, um like who can actually teach you every day and and teach you about the you know every day you're brewing something new or tasting something new and uh and even still when I started roasting he was one of the first people that I'd send to and I'd you know say like Paul what do you think of these try them and he'd be like okay this one's underdeveloped this one is you know a little flat this one might be a little over roasted so I would take all his notes uh and kind of go back to the drawing board he was one of those you know mentor figures that I could be like okay, let me take his notes and go back and do another, you know, 10, 20 batches and see how that comes out. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So I, I like the idea that y'all partnered up like pretty quickly. And I'm kind of curious, do you feel it's helped you kind of keep moving at a faster pace, having like somebody else there with you? That's kind of, you know, like <laughs> also keeping you on track as well and not letting you kind of get derailed and discouraged or, or anything like that? Yeah, I will say hands down, uh, partnering with Misha was one of the best decisions I could have made. And there wouldn't really, without that partnership, we, you know, there wouldn't be a business because he is the one who, who is, pushes me to, you know, always want to do more and, and make this company as good as it can be and kind of grow it as much as we can. Um, and when you're, when you're solo, there is literally so much to just kind of, even, even now, like there's, you, it takes teams to make these businesses happen and make them grow. And when you're so small and even by yourself, you're like, you know, like we were joking about before, there's literally only so many hours in the day. And especially when you're like, you're like, okay, I'm roasting. And then you're like, okay, I'm going to go drive around and prospect, or maybe I'm delivering or, oh, maybe, you know, I'm going to take the cart out today. Oh, I got to do social media. I got to spend a whole day taking pictures and doing content. Or I got to, you know, and there's just this list of things that you just, try to do the best you can to squeeze in there and kind of going solo. I don't think, you know, you kind of get overwhelmed and there's a lot of those moments of doubts and you're going, and then maybe you're like, ah, oh, maybe I'll go do something else or go over here. And, you know, I always hear people unfortunately say like, oh yeah, I don't want to partner because they get in my way or like, oh, we disagree. We can't agree. The, the number one reason I see like partnerships fail is people say like, oh yeah, we just don't get along. Like he's, you know, buttoning in my stuff or trying to take over or do, you know, and Misha and I over years have never, I, I we both knew from the start that this was going to work out as a partnership because we've always been such tight friends that there has never been a moment where like, yeah. you don't have to question anything. You know, there's no doubt. There's no like, what are you doing over here? Or like, why did you post that? Or, you know, like what, none of that. So I always say we wouldn't have this business without him. So <laughs> Yeah, see, that's about, it seems like that's almost the only way to kind of know for certain that a partnership is going to, you know, somewhat be successful is if you have those years of experience with each other, either at a different place, different job or, any, or something like that. So I'm kind of curious though, like, so when did you reach out to me initially? Was it 2020 on, on the Beamer or? <laughs> um i it must have been yeah i think it was probably about 2020 yeah because i'm just like dude y'all you're, you're, are moving quick so like <laughs> hey it was it was not that quick like um yeah i probably first reached out to you in 2020 and it was probably just to to talk shop i don't even um back then it was probably just a fan i told you i was a fan of your videos from the start so yeah you know, like you know, when you go online, like I'm glad I found your videos, or I think we were talking in the uh, one of the Facebook forums to the roasters, yep, I think yep. the roasters page, which if anyone's listening to this, who's not on there, it's a great tool to use. Dude, you know, probably to one of the people. best resources. Yeah, I think it's, um, I forget the name of the group off the top of my head. I think it's the, uh, just coffee roasters forum or something like or, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that's such a great place to start and to just learn. If I had started that, you know, been on that page from the very start, I would have saved myself so much trial and error, but. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, I, 
I would say we're moving at, we move at a pretty organic pace. So, you know, we never, with anything we do, we never strive to be like a flash in the pan kind of project where like you peak and you're like, you know, the hottest thing. And then you just, you know, a couple months later, everyone's like, well, what happened to those guys? Where do they go? So we've always just tried to, you know, keep everything nice and lean and work as slow and steady as we can. And we make, you know, our uh, business moves when the time is right. So if it, you know, what Misha will say is if it doesn't make sense, we, it's pretty simple. If it doesn't make sense, we don't do it. If it makes sense, we do it. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty straightforward. And, and I, I talk about, I have, a, I have a couple other businesses and I've always told people like, I, I am not out here to get rich quick. I think slow and steady has always been the way it's always been my experience, the way my band's gone, the way like my businesses have gone. And the example I like to give is like, if you want longevity, um, if you're on slow and steady, you're going to have problems, but they're just going to be just outside of your wheelhouse. So you'll be able to figure out the solution and you'll learn and you'll be able to handle it. If you, if you're a flash and pan or you're blowing up, it's like, you may not even understand the problems or even know what to look out for. You know, that yeah, stuff kind of scares me. I like the slow and steady. So it's funny because I guess, you know, externally it probably looks like things have been moving fast. For, for Rosie and I, it looks pretty, pretty steady and slow. It always feels like we're waiting for stuff. But yeah, like I think there's a couple of things. Like when we started, I, I, and this is where I knew Rosie would be fun, but we kind of set this out as a mission statement. It's like, dude, if we don't make money for five years, I don't care. You know, like it's, let's not make this about making money. Let's make this about doing, doing it right and taking our time and learning. Like we're, we, don't, we both didn't know what we were doing. It's like, let's, let's use this as an opportunity to learn. And hopefully the mistakes we make aren't too bad because it's all just small things and, and we'll go as we go. And, you know, as it grows, we'll, we'll see, you know, if five years down the line, we're still in debt. All right, maybe we have a conversation then, but let's not start freaking out about money right now. And let's try to make decisions that are smart for the business and not be greedy. And that's one of those things I always see, you know, some, some people struggle with, or if you're talking about partners that disagree, you have someone who wants to kick the quick cash out and we're more on the reinvestment side. It's like, no, let's, the money will come. Let, we'll, we'll figure that stuff out. Uh, you know, I want to make sure everyone's paid and that everything, but the business always comes first. And uh, I believe in the business. I want to grow the business. And, and as long as everyone's on the same page there, there's no problems. I knew we'd be on the same page. We've never once had discussion. So um, you know, that, that, that I think is one of the most key things, uh, with starting a business and, and sort of whatever success we have seen so far, whatever growth we have seen so far is directly attributed to that attitude. Yeah, no, that's super cool. I, that's, that's a really good attitude too. Cause I do think a lot of people go in with a shorter time frame. you know, where, you know, they want to figure it out in six months to a year. And that's why I tell a lot of people too, that's kind of getting into it. It's, you're, you you need to plan for years out, you know? Right, right. <clears throat> well, I always, you know, it, being in the industry, you know, too, it's like anyone who tries to get into coffee for like a get rich quick investment is going to learn real quick that it's just not how it works. You know, if yeah. you don't have, this is one business where if you don't have passion, like you're going to, you're going to have an early exit real quick, <laughs> whether it's six months or a year or, you know, how many people do you see? Like, oh, I think I want to get into coffee. And then a year later, they're like, Mm, nah, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think a lot of people, and even me, like there is this like fantasy dream, you know, you're at your coffee shop and you know, you got everybody working and you're in the back, just like reading a book at a table, you know, just enjoying your morning as everybody's just like making you money. And it's like, yeah, you know, in the beginning, I feel everybody kind of wants that they want like their place where they can go and like, it's their coffee shop. But it's like, if you're there, you're probably going to be working, you know? Oh yeah. 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 Nonstop too. Yeah. If you're not at the bar, you're, you know, doing, you know, doing something else and kind of where we're at too, we have, um, you know, we're trying to hit a couple different facets with this, this roastery. So same deal. It's like, we're not, you know, roasting or we don't have the cart out, then we're here or we're out or I'm in the field doing sales calls. And um, yeah, so there's always, there's never not something to do, you know? I guess as far as like timeline, I kind of want to know. So you started on the Beamer and then what did you kind of go from there? But did you go into the coffee shop next or did you start roasting just roasting? No, the, so the plan was to kind of always be wholesale roasters and, you know, it, roasting is still to this day, like I'm a okay barista, you know, I've had a lot of training I've, you know, spent time in a couple shops, but 
you got to remember uh, where I'm coming from in New Jersey at the time, there was no, that's where I'm originally from. Uh, there really was no like specialty coffee scene around me. Uh, you know, there was like Starbucks, um, but it wasn't until like, you know, I started seeing blue bottles pop up in Manhattan too, not even in Jersey. So, you know, if you want a coffee, you went to the diner. Like we didn't really, it wasn't until like maybe 2000 and like, 13, 12, 13, um, that when, you know, we really started, or I started traveling, you know, a lot with Misha, um, and we were going to places like, you know, New Zealand or Australia, and you're like, whoa, what the, you know, what are they doing here? They're like, what is the sorcery, you know, <laughs> or, you know, anywhere in Europe or, and I just fell in love with it, like, kind of like, uh, same deal. I, I viewed these baristas and these roasters as like chefs, you know, they're like, putting this, this beautiful, uh, elegant thing together that just tastes delicious. And it's kind of like this art meets science. And it takes so much like dedication just to make this, this drink that we love. Uh, and I was like, man, I really want to be part of this. The, the U S is going to catch up. And I really, really want to be a part of that movement. Um, so flash, you know, flash forward a couple of years when, uh, you know, my wife was the one she knew I was all about roasting and we're lucky enough to have an importer that's relatively close to us. It's very popular in Southern California. And going there, it was like a kid going to Blockbuster video, man. Like I'd go in there and I was like, whoa, like there's the roaster in the shop. And there was like all the bags of green and they get the bar. And, uh, you know, she was the one who was, you know, she's like, well, get yourself, you know, get, get a roaster and try it out. So I uh, literally just countless, countless, countless batches of the Beamer and smoking out the kitchen and, moving into the garage and it was that and a fresh roast. I had a fresh roast too for a little bit um, just to kind of see the differences between like a small air roaster and a drum roaster. And uh, we were going on that for a while. And then I actually joined a collective down in uh, Vista, California, the California Roasting Collective, which was fantastic. Same deal. It's like you walk into this collective and there's like, it's like, here's all the roasters, you know, and these guys. Is that work. where like Tired Eyes and? Yeah, yeah, that's where, like, yeah, that's, that's where that's Tired where Eyes is down there too. Yeah, and those guys are like, their their shop is amazing. Steady State, you know, is such a, uh, you know, inspirational coffee shop and they're just great roasters. Uh, the only problem for me is that it's, you know, it's like an hour, hour and a half away. And it's, it was just tricky. I didn't need, as like a small roaster, you don't really need to be, doing huge batches if i roasted you know on their like sf25 um what am i going to do with all that i'm going to drink it or give it away or something yeah. but i need it i wanted to experiment more with different varieties of coffee because i was still learning at the time you know you want to see how a natural roast versus a washed or a yeah. you know a honey um and while they have smaller roasters there it's you're not going to drive three hours round trip to roast a kilo of coffee are you you know <laughs> gotcha so uh you know me and misha you know we, we were kind of looking at all the options and i said okay we need like we need to up the ante here we need like a real roaster and uh we settled on a mill city three kilogram because it was the perfect size to fit in a garage and we literally cut out the my stucco garage invented it right out the garage blew it you know right in the neighborhood and the neighbors uh they're all cool with it luckily and that was kind of the huge step up you know because you look at all these videos i think you've said it in the past too you can watch all these videos of like how to roast and roasting on different roasters you can watch someone else roast and you're like okay yeah. cool, you know but until you get behind the machine and you know you really learn like all those nuances, um, you know, that's, that's just like, that was kind of like the game changing moment for the business. Um, Cause it's like, Oh, we can, we can really, you know, utilize everything on this machine to our advantage and really roast some good coffee now. So uh, we stayed on that mill city was the one that kind of like, you know, helped really turn the, turn the business, um, you know, and allow us to get, you know, get a couple of wholesale clients under our belt, you know, crank out more batches, uh, and once we outgrew that, we went to another collective in Orange County, which um, then I switched over to the Probat. It was a P12, P212, um, which was great. That was another big step up because you're going from a three kilogram to a 12 kilogram is like, and a Probat too. You're like, well, this is, you know, this is crazy. Was it, did it feel that much different? Like from a Probat uh, to a Mill City? To me, it did. I was, I was really excited on it, you know, cause it's like, oh, this is the big time, you know, yeah. it's a 12 kilogram roaster, but um, you know, you kind of already know you're just taking um, everything you're applying to one machine and learning the nuances of another machine. And that's kind of what I said about all these manufacturers is, you know, 
you love that conversation of like, what's the best roaster, you know, like who makes the best roaster. And it's like, man, it's more about, you know, the, the person behind the machine and the quality of green you're putting in it, because, you know, you can learn a couple of nuances, learn how a machine's going to react and, you know, what it's going to do and what it's capable of. And if you put some green, good green through that, you're going to have good coffee at the end of the day. So I don't care if it's a Mill City or a Probat, you know, or a Diedrich or uh, San Fran, you know, they're all going to produce really good coffee. So I kind of yeah. hope that conversation gets put to bed at, at some point. Yeah, <laughs> dude, that's actually a very good, uh, it really does depend on the coffee. Cause there, there are some like coffees you go buy is pretty cheap or whatever. And it's like, I can't, there's no way I can roast it to make it taste good. I've tried so many ways, but then there's some quality coffees you get and it's like, it's hard to get rid of the blueberry flavor. Right. You know what I mean? It's like, so some are just so much easier than others, but it's because of that quality. You're, you're definitely paying a good bit for it, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. And I'm not saying you have to be spending, you know, like 10 to $15 on your green, you know, oh, you, yeah. you can get some great green, you know, for, uh, you know, the four or $5 range. I don't know what price is going up now. It used to be, you could get it for in the yeah. three, threes, but, but still you, you know, it's just uh, get it on the cupping table. And, you know, I'm so glad that we've, uh, you know, had the fortune of working with importers locally that you can actually go in and, you know, that's what they're there for. They're like, hey, what do you want? You want to try some stuff? Like, let's put 20 coffees on the table and cup them and learn about them. And it's going to help you make these decisions a lot better. All right. So uh, let's go into the, your uh, importer then. It's, how, how, how do you pronounce it? <laughs> Hasea Coffee Source here in Anaheim, it- California. Okay. So what all do, uh, is it just like cafe imports or kind of a place like that? Or are they like kind of a small local place? It, it, you know what? They're, they're a small family owned uh, company and they basically uh, our importer, uh, Jared Hales, we can't say enough good things about him. Um, he was formerly, you know, with another uh, bigger importer, and I guess at some point along the way, he uh, wanted to shift gears and start his own business. Uh, you know, that was that was his dream. And he uh, he started Hasea and he, it's basically like having, you know, your importer and a friend and a coffee expert who's just like a, a quick phone call away. And um, he we met because I was such a coffee nerd, uh, at his former employer, um, where he was, you know, he was working as their green buyer and, you know, he was, he was doing so much there. And, you know, I was, uh, way up in the, in the classes, they did like cupping classes and this, that, and the other. And, um, we met and we kind of just hit it off and became, you know, friends first, which is like, that's such a nice thing to say about the industry because that's what is it's supposed to be like, like making friends. You know, we've made so many friends in the coffee community uh, from other shops, importers, other roasters. And, you know, I've never viewed anyone, even like uh, who you'd put on paper as like your, you know, competition. I've never viewed anyone as competition. There's, you know, we, we always say community, not competition. So, oh yeah. Uh, he just, we just hit it off and he became such a good friend. And I've never met anyone in my life who knew more about coffee and was more passionate about coffee than, than he was. And, um, so that's kind of where you go. Like you go where the relationships are, you know? So he said, Hey, you know, I was buying from his, his, uh, the importer he was working for. And he said, Hey, I'm starting this new thing. I'm branching out on my own family. You know, it's going to be the whole family in the business. And I said, dude, not even a question, you know, we're there. Um, so he's been such an integral part of the success of our business because, you know, we do, we just meet up and that's, you know, half of being a roaster is, you know, roasting and tasting coffee. So we'll meet up, uh, you know, a couple of times a month and, and just taste coffee. You know, he kind of gives us and anyone not working with an importer, um, you know, if you're lucky to have one by you, I would definitely suggest making the connection and forging some kind of relationship because, they're the person who is kind of like your, um, you know, your, your guideline or your, your lifeline to the connections to these farms and what coffee's coming in. And, um, you know, he really kind of acts as, uh, and we can get into, you know, the whole direct trade thing if you want, but, you know, for a lot of these farms, like as a smaller roaster, you know, it doesn't even make sense to do yeah. direct, trade. you know, like, what are they, what are you going to ask for? Like, I remember, and I don't know if you remember the same, but I remember when I was not even buying full bat, like bags of coffee, I was buying like, you know, five or 10 pounds at a time or 20 pounds at a time. So, you know, you're not going to like, just call up these farms and say like, Hey, I'd like to, you know, get a couple of pounds of coffee. You want to send it up here? Yeah. Yeah. 
So your importer uh, kind of acts as that gateway to the farms, uh, you know, where they've for they they have forged these relationships. They are doing the tours yearly. They're you know communicating with these farmers uh, year round. And they kind of, you know, give you that info. They say, hey, here's the farms we're working with. Here's the crops that there are coming in. Here's, you know, we come in, we taste them. Here's the price points. You know, uh, this, you know, maybe this farmer's doing this. Do you like more experimental coffees? This farmer's doing this. And this is what they're, you know, what programs are running. And this is what they're doing with their community. And, you know, uh, you kind of get all this, this knowledge and you kind of learn, you know, hand in hand what the farms are doing and what far and what coffee they're producing. Um, and they kind of, what Hasea does, which I love is they kind of build you up to when you are ready for direct trade. So there's no, you know, if you, if I called it Jared tomorrow and I said, Hey, we're big enough. I want a whole shipping container of coffee. He would say like, uh, here's Mario's number, you know, in El Salvador, give him a call. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, that'd be so, cool. Yeah. <laughs> one, so, one other thing to say about him real quick is that he's also, a, a, a mentor and an advisor especially oh yeah know. yeah he's he got yeah. so much really really important and useful advice from him that that uh, that saved us a lot of trouble and money and trial and error and it felt like having like uh you know another person on board who was just looking out for us he's, he's, a, he's a really good dude as, as as rosie said i've never met a person on the planet who knows more about coffee and whose palate is as dot was he's a q q roaster or q q grater q grater <laughs> q, uh, yeah. q grater yeah, and then they have to calibrate that every three years you know like the rob guy can, oh, yeah. <laughs> i said rob can edit that part so. you know, the q grater, sorry. oh no dude um so but like like he he has, has such an encyclopedic knowledge about coffee and then he has learned what we like because we're we, we have we have our preferences and there's obviously so much to choose from that that he's presenting stuff to us and and sometimes it's stuff we wouldn't expect to like but you know a lot of these farms have these micro lots and whatever that where you're, you're getting you're getting really interesting uh, experimental stuff sometimes you know and it's like whoa this is awesome. Yeah, well, he's gonna, different. yeah, they're going to help across the board. So if you say, you know, hey, I need like a, a natural Brazilian, I've got a client who, you know, wants a natural Brazil as a base for his espresso. And he's going to say, okay, here's, you know, here's what we have. Here are the options. Come in and taste them and, you know, take some samples, roast them and try them out. And, uh, you know, here's the farms. Here's what the schedule looks like. Here's what's coming in. Um, here's, you know, the price points. So, yeah, it is like having this this mentor and this guide uh, who can put these options in front of you and kind of help you make these decisions. Uh, because before that, you know, I would I, I love that sites like, uh, you know, Coffee Shrub or Sweet Maria's or, you know, Royal, you can just go online and, you know, pick some coffee out and get it. But, you know, they have so many options that as I'd be curious to know as like a new roaster, what do you look for? You know, what do you go for? Um, you know, because... I think a lot of us, I don't know, how, how did you start, Rob? When you first started roasting, what attracted you to a certain green coffee? Honestly, just like what other people were talking about. Right? You, know, yeah. like you heard of like <laughs> yeah. the Ethiopian Yager Chef and it's like, well, yeah, yeah. let me go try this one Ethiopian Yager Chef. And you're like, well, exactly. why, why is there seven of them? You know, like they're offering <laughs> seven of them. Well, like, yeah. Let me just pick two or three that are the most expensive and see what they taste. It's like the most random way you kind of sure. choose yeah. to do things, you know? Yeah. Which is, which is great too. Yeah. I, I was the same way. And I was like, Oh, I'm going to try it from, I like, I wanted to try it from all over the world. I was like, I want to try this coffee and see how it compares to an Indonesian coffee and how that compares to a, a Colombian coffee. But, um, you know, working with an importer, they can kind of, you know, help narrow that down and, and kind of put it right in front of you properly. Yeah. And so like, here, taste these, we're going to taste these 20 coffees and you're going to tell me what you like and why. And I'm going to tell you all about them. And it's going to kind of help guide you uh, to make the right decisions, not only for, you know, to shape your brand or what kind of coffee roaster you want to be, but on the business end too, to make sure that, you know, you're pricing accordingly and you're, you know, um, you're going in the right direction. Yeah. That's actually a really good kind of, uh, I think, cause I, I never, even, in the beginning, I never even thought of really hitting up any importers. You know, because one, we don't really have any around us. You would think New Orleans would, but it's kind of more like Folgers. I think we got uh, James Schmuckers down there or whatever, you know, that owns yeah. like Folgers. So it's like, it's kind of more commodity grade. It's nobody that's really doing specialty here. So 
Um, but that's really cool. So y'all, that's one thing about like Southern California, y'all are around a lot of specialty coffee shops, roasters, and I guess importers too. Are there any other importers that are kind of, you know, good down there? Or? Um, so there's a couple, um, we have, you know, obviously, uh, Hesea is, is who we've, you know, worked with from, for years now. There's, uh, Bodhi Leaf, which I'm sure you've heard of. I've heard of Bodhi Leaf, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're in Anaheim as well. They're not too far and, um, you know, they're doing great things too. They got a couple of cafes and like I said, they were the ones, you know, who had the, the big hub where they, you know, they've got their, their Dietrich, their IR12 in there, where so you can go get your coffee and watch them roast. And you could see the warehouse with all the, you know, the green coffee. And it's like for, you know, a roaster, it's like a kid in the candy shop, you know, it's, it's oh, yeah. awesome. Um, but no, not, not too many more that I know of down here. I know there's probably one or two in LA. Um, and then, you know, I know the, the lot that's up in the Bay area, but, uh, no, we have been fortunate that, yeah, not only is there a lot of specialty roasters and shops here, but we have access to importers too. So, yeah, like I said, I think it, it definitely has helped, uh, you know, anyone out there who's not sure, you know, what direction to go is try to find a, a contact with any of these importers. Even if you don't, you don't have to have one by you, you know, I'm sure, uh, cafe imports or Royal, they have, you know, people that you can you know, reach out to and just, yeah, fire your account rep or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Um, but at the same time that makes it difficult because, you know, being the new guys on the block, you know, you're, you're coming around and, uh, you know, there's room for everyone. That's part of the reason we're down here in, in South County is, uh, you know, it's, it's still growing here too. You know, like you yeah. said, you're, you're in kind of the land of, uh, commod a lot of commodity grade and where we are, it's kind of like, you know, uh, San Diego and LA are obviously booming. And then North Orange County is starting to explode as well. You know, Costa Mesa, Newport areas, Fullerton, there's, you know, shop, I see a new shop popping up every couple of weeks. Uh, and this pocket we're in is very, you know, kind of untapped. Um, and that's not to say that we thought, oh, you know, if either they say like, if there's nothing there, there might be a reason, you know, yeah. <laughs> uh, but we thought, Hey, you know what, this is going to catch on. It is going to grow. It's going to spread and catch on. So instead of going to a town where, you know, there's someone else down the street doing it, let's go somewhere where we can kind of grow with the communities down here and kind of, we know education is a big part of what goes into this and what we do. And it is, it's a little harder, you know, if you've got someone who is so used to drinking, you know, uh, Starbucks, um, you know, all week, seven days a week, you know, it's going to take a little education and a little, you know, persuasiveness and, you know, I, just trying it, trying it and educating is such a, a big part of this movement. And I think people tend to forget that, um, <clears throat> you know, that it's not just because it's, it's huge in your city doesn't mean it's huge in every city. Some people yeah. still put you like, you know, why, why is that, you know, latte is $6. Like, what, what is that? Yeah. <laughs> that inflation going up. So what you know, uh, a bag of beans is $24. <laughs> like what, what you got in there? Yeah. yeah then <clears throat> I feel cause like out here in Louisiana, it's like, I mean, people like $7 is expensive for a lot of people out here for coffee, you know? So it's like yeah. when you have coffee on the shelf, that's 14, 15, even $20. It's like, a lot of people can't even comprehend why it would be that right. much, you know, because we're, we're very commodity coffee focused down here, Folgers and Maxwell house. And um, yeah, so that's kind of one cool thing. I, I feel y'all have educated, you know, the public enough there. There's enough education out there that, you know, why specialty coffee may be more expensive where here it's, I mean, people don't even know what the term is, you know, right. so that's something we kind of got to do over here. Cause we don't have very many specialty coffee shops, but that's the other thing too, is we don't have enough, we don't have as many people willing to buy a 15 to $20 bag of coffee either, you know, cause that market really hasn't kind of been educated. I feel yet. Yeah. But yeah and I, do, all... I, I do want to talk about like, so y'all's place you're, you're in now. Um, when did you decide to do that? And what was y'all's kind of, I guess, um, uh, what was y'all's plan with that? <clears throat> so this build out here, the roastery and the tasting room that I'm in now, uh, it, it was definitely not easy, uh, finding a place and you'd know this too. I'd love to hear about, you know, your, your progress, uh, cause I've been following it. <laughs> yeah, it's been a disaster. It, <laughs> literally, I didn't think it would be, uh, that like, so as hard as it was to find a place that, uh, you know, that you could actually roast coffee considering, and we had the right permits considering I, it was easier to get a permit to roast out of my home than it was to find a place to actually set up a commercial roastery. 
Uh, and part of that is that it is not that, you know, I, we probably looked at literally 20 to 25 spaces and it's almost like the universe has to align for you to find like the right space, um, you know, because and everyone's like, well, how come you're in a commercial industrial area? It's like, well, because we have a 15 kilogram roaster and, you know, you you can't just throw that up anywhere, you know, if uh, uh, it, whether it's a retail area that might be too expensive or there's not enough space or you're in a residential area, uh, you know, when you go into a place and you say, hey, I'm going to come in, I'm going to. First, I need some, you know, some gas. I need natural gas. I need to put in a floor uh, sink. So I'm going to dig up your floors, uh, you know, to run my drains, my sinks. And then I'm going to cut a big hole through your roof so I can vent this sucker out of there. Um, and, and a lot of places are like, what? Wait, what are you trying to do? <laughs> Next tenant, please. <laughs> yeah. So they, yeah. And they, a lot of these places just want, so, and I was like, oh, by the way, this is going to take us a little while. So I want, you know, I want a little abatement here, you know, like we're, you know, we're a business. It's going to take a little bit to get up and running. And uh, the problem in retail, I found that they'll kind of roll out the carpet for you. They're like, oh, well, you know, here's 30 grand in TI. Like, we think this is cool. Bring it here. Uh, but the rent, you know, these days is just is getting astronomical, not to mention that, you know, retail spaces are more expensive. And in coffee, you know, the gender, if you're just doing a retail cafe, the idea is like, you know, kind of have the smallest footprint possible that you can get away with. Um, and we kind of just needed more space for the operation. So commercial industrial was the way to go. But I always said, we need a place in the front where kind of like a brewery, you know, craft breweries are, oh, are yeah. really, really big around here. And it's the same concept where like, you know, the roasters I see that don't, a lot of them are fantastic. And sometimes some of them will be like, oh, we can't figure out why my brand won't grow. My, oh, I'm sorry, my brand won't grow. And I say, because no one can get to you. No, how can people access you? Like, yeah, like e-commerce is great and you're on the internet and you know you can go out and get wholesale accounts, but you have to have a place where like the public can come in, meet you, like you're because you're it's your business, you're selling yeah. yourself, you know. Uh, but come in and see what you're about, see what your aesthetic is, and try the product, you know, and get some product. So uh it kind of just worked out after looking for months probably six months we finally found a place where we could have you know the roasting in the back and then build out a little tasting room in the front is what we call it so how much square footage do you have for the roastery uh the whole uh unit is 1400 square feet and that's split up between uh, there's a couple hundred square feet there's a small warehouse and then the center room you know the other reason we got this space is it was and i'll tell this to anyone building out uh, and you know this too, Rob, is that look for places that already have some of the work done. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so going, if you're starting from scratch, you are going to be in for uh, the long haul, man, on, on your, on your, your build out. But if you can go in and get as much stuff that's already done as possible, then do so. So we got a little lucky in that this was uh, previously like a lab. They made something in the middle room. I'm not sure what. So they already kind of had this isolated room where, you know, uh, all we had to do was kind of tweak the plumbing a little bit and obviously get the roaster installed and, you know, kind of dial that in. Um, but otherwise, you know, we kind of did everything this front, you know, this used to be an office. So we just, you know, kind of tore up some carpet, you know, and did the, the usual, you know, floors, walls, ceilings, and kind of get everything up to code. And, you know, here we are a year, we started the process a year ago and here we are <laughs> Yeah, a Dude, year later, so so it's been a long journey. Yeah, I hear that. It's like I'm over here thinking y'all are moving quick. Y'all over here thinking y'all oh, we slow, yeah, but. yeah, we've been yeah, we've been working on this for a year now. You know, because we got to the point where, and, and anyone who's in a collective or like a shared facility or toll roasting, I always say like, hey, stay there as long as you can until it doesn't make sense and you need. You're like, okay, we have X amount of business, uh, but we're kind of being hurt in these areas, and we really need to take this next step and and be able to grow the brand. Um, so that's kind of, that was our thought process here is like, okay, I'm roasting X amount of hours paying someone else at their facility, uh, which is great, but it's not really helping our brand, man. People are, you know, they want to know what you're doing. They want to know what you have going on, you know, who's working there, who are you, uh, and what, you know, what's the feel, what's your product. So, yeah, it was kind of like, you know, uh, it was time to start that process. And as you know, it was just, uh, it could just be so taxing on you. <laughs> yeah, it definitely takes a while. Yeah, because you have these rosy glasses, like, ah, oh, you know, three or four months, and then, you know, you kind of, nah, dude, it's way longer than that. But yeah, so you have the three kilogram in the, uh, 
in your restaurant now or i still have it in the garage i want to so the the goal is to install it here at some point and <laughs> i'd love to be that spot for other roasters in the area because i was one of them who were like hey i really want to get into this you know i want to be able to invite people in do some training some roaster classes and then have them say like hey you know i'd love to come toll roast on your equipment and it's like get on in here man learn you know use start on the three kilogram and then work up to the 15 kilogram you know oh, so you do have the 15 in there then Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I didn't realize you had. So you have it already. Oh yeah, yeah. Got yeah. you, got you. Okay, that's up and running. That you know, that was a. Uh, 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 that was a fun story. How, how, <laughs> how, how was, are we saying or not saying about that? <laughs> yeah, Robin. Any roaster listening, you know, you know how it is buying a new one. You know, we were just talking about uh, uh, you know, your process before we started the podcast. But, um, you know, one of the most fun things you can do as a roaster is you know, pick some new equipment or as a barista in general or anyone, you know, is pick, pick some new equipment and gets behind some machines and try them out. And, uh, we chose a very, very hard time to be, uh, you know, everyone thinks like you just, you don't, you're not just going to the store and buying these machines. Everyone knows it usually takes around three, four months and, uh, you know, maybe a little longer. And with our manufacturer, we had our heart set on a certain machine and it was at month like nine or 10, um, where we had to kind of pull the plug and switch course. Cause we were just, you know, at that point, it's like, yo, we're, we're hemorrhaging money. You're like, we're just paying for a place and we don't have this equipment that was promised to us. So, you know, a quick phone call to, to Steve green. We love, you know, can't say enough good things about the mill city team. Um, you know, quick phone call to Steve green. And he's like, I got you guys. I got a 15 K, you know, let's get it, get it up and running for you. So, oh, what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No lie. So, so you got a 15 K mill city. Yeah. Yep. Um, you know, I just can't say enough good things about their team with the people forget when they're buying equipment. And this also goes back to the roasters too. And Steve himself has made videos about this. Like uh, everyone thinks you need it. I've even heard people say, you know, here, like, oh, you're not roasting on X roaster. Well, you don't really know what you're doing then, right? And it's like, that's the most asinine thing I've ever heard. You know, uh, people seem to think like there's certain manufacturers that makes you, you know, better in some way. Um, but, you know, we, we only had our heart set on a certain machine because I had been using it for the last year. Uh, and we were very excited to get it. And people forget that uh, customer service is such a big part of yeah, running in general yeah, yeah especially in manufacturing so you know uh i i just feel like you know steve green his team gets it they're there for you every step of the way you know this isn't a mill city pitch i'm not trying to sell them but man like you call them they're there to help you you know so if something's wrong they're there to help you um and it was just such a pleasure to, to be able to continue working with them and get the new machine in there. Um, because, you know, with their lack of transparency, the other manufacturer could have, if we didn't do anything, we could have, you know, just kept bleeding money. And, you know, yeah, we, might, we might still not have the machine. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. Man, if you don't mind me asking, which was it a like a popular roaster or? It, yeah, yes, it was. Yeah, it was uh, uh, one of the, you know, I'd say one of the big three or four, you know, is popular okay. and, and they're great. You know, I'm not knocking them by any means. I would never, I love every, you know, we've spoken with every rep for every manufacturer and they're all fantastic, but some are better. You know, you call Lauren and you say like, I want a Falcon and they're going to say, okay, it's an 18 month lead time. Like put, you know, take, we'll take you to positive, put your name on the list and we'll see you next year. Um, and some of them, I just think, you know, maybe it's not their fault. I know the supply chain has screwed everyone, uh, you know, over the course of the last two years. Um, but it's just kind of transparency. Like if you, and, and I get it, man, like these guys, you know, a anyone that you don't want to lose a sale. Like if you lose your customer, you can't just say, I don't know, you know, but that is sometimes that's the reality of, of what the answer is. I don't know. I don't know. You, you know, let's talk about it. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of, you know, when people, uh, kind of set you up thinking one thing and you have this expectation and then, you know, maybe not to their fault, but uh, it's not kind of a, a timing where you want to be strung along uh, and kind of just be left in the dark. Yeah. That's the thing too. Like everything's based on, I mean, you're going to be paying rent. And if you don't have a register there, if we got, we kind of have this, that's my idea. Like it, where I work, like if you have a, a million dollar machine and it's sitting there if it's not running 
for longer than a day, you're, 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 you're losing money basically. Right. You know what right. I mean? So it's like, you have to keep it running. If you're putting that much money into a machine, it's, it's gotta be going, you know? And if you're waiting 18 months or something for a machine or nine months, and then it could have been even longer. I mean, that's nine months of operation you done missed out on. Yeah, exactly. So, well, and you know, my, my issue is that we were working on this place while paying the yeah. somewhere else. Uh, while also, you know, you get to the stage and this is, you know, something else I like to talk about is anytime people ask when they know it's time to upgrade their machine. And I always say, look, we knew when grossing on the three kilogram was taken away from other areas of the business, because you're literally standing behind this small machine, like all day and night, it would take me three days, you know, sometimes just to roast for, uh, you know, a client or two. And that's how, you know, you got to figure out another course, whether it's toll roasting or investing in a new piece of equipment. But, you know, like I said, I love all, all the manufacturers. I love all the reps. Um, but yeah, the, the lack of transparency really hurt us, you know, when three to four months turns into month 10 and it's, you know, it's always like, ah, oh, we promise, you know, it was promised so many times. Like next Did you able month, to get your money back or no? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It got to the point where, and I, <clears throat> I love the rep there too i just said we need to go a different direction you know this is it's gone on long enough you know yeah it's sad but what are you gonna do you know right exactly Happy, you know? we love mill city we love steve green Nick. yeah and, and I, the other thing like with mill city is they put out so much content I, I like the way they do business where they'll put out all these roasting courses and they never tell you to like go buy their their roaster or that their roaster is even the best they're just putting out a bunch of content and it's like you're, you're consuming episode after episode after episode and now you know steve you used to know joe although he don't work there anymore and stuff like that and you get to know these people yeah and it's like all they did was just give you some ma amazing content oh and you know? so much of it is free too it, exactly yeah, like yeah that's the whole thing you know yeah. but and then they offer like the classes and stuff like that um so when you got when you buy a roaster from there like do they offer a class to go up there or anything or yeah like yeah they do yeah um everything is you know with, with i think most uh roasters will have you in obviously when you yeah. get it uh, some manufacturers will actually, I think like Loring, you have to have one of their people come to you. I might be, I don't want to speak out of term here, but yeah, I, I think, think you do. Cause they kind of help you install like the, yeah, yeah. They're pretty, you know, tight about you know, type stuff and all that. Yeah. They got a, a look on it before you're up and running, but yeah, any of them, you know, they obviously have the, you know, the periods where you come into their facility, but during COVID it's a little tough. Cause a lot of people, you know, you're not trying to jump on a plane for a couple of days and uh, so a lot of them, you know, like Mill City was so good about doing it, everything through Skype, even maintenance, you know, if I've got any issues or, you know, they're right there, we do a bunch of Skype calls, uh, and they still do them educational and service through Skype, which is great. Yeah, or it's not Skype, uh, zoom, whatever. I don't see yeah, zoom chat. Yeah, sorry, Skype. Yeah, Skype. Like, <laughs> They're off the planet, right? <laughs> I haven't heard of them in a while. <laughs> I'm dating myself here. Yeah, Skype. So between wholesale and retail, as far as like your, your sales and stuff like that, what do you mostly focus on? We're always, uh, we've always mostly been focused on the wholesale aspect of it uh, because at the core, you know, roasting is our passion and it's what we love to do. Like I said, I love being behind the bar. I love going out and, you know, uh, interacting with the public and serving coffee. It's just, it's in my blood, you know, the service industry just runs through me. Hospitality just runs through me. Uh, but I love nothing more than just, you know, cranking out the batches, bagging and delivering, honestly. So, and we're small, so we do, you know, like I said, there's no big team here. It's all, you know, all us. So, uh, if you're, you know, if you're using us, you're usually, you know, on the phone with, with one of us, or you're seeing me, you know, delivering your coffee or, you know, helping with your, uh, whatever it may be. But um, yeah, primarily wholesale. And then down the road, we would love to do like a, a retail cafe as well. But that's kind of like the reward, you know, uh, we're always, like we said, growing slow and steady. Um, you know, the reward of the success of this will be, you know, having a, a retail cafe where we can be part of the community and, you know, have this nice sit down environment and atmosphere and really do it right. The tasting room is beautiful. But it's uh, we understand that we're in commercial industrial, so it's not like you know, we don't expect like lines out the door when we. <laughs> yeah. but that's the other thing too, like 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 you're saying, it just gives people you know a chance to come and taste your coffee and stuff like that. Because 
that was one of those things too like when you start roasting i feel a lot of people want samples and it's like in the beginning you're not even you're just like sample 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 and you're like wow this is a ton of coffee i'm giving out for just free you know because yeah. sometimes nobody you know they want to buy the 13 dollar bag or 15 dollar bag after they try a little sample so you just kind of waste so many samples but it'd be cool if you had like a place where they can actually come you could you know talk to them and stuff like that so are you going to be open like every day or are you just going to be like we're trying to figure that out now but like you said the best part you know it, it, is the ability to bring in people even uh, like on a private scale right now and just put the product in front of them yeah. um, because that's the hardest part is you know especially being a small guy or maybe like a garage startup you know uh, you can, you know, pound the pavement and knock on the doors, which is, you know, what I've done with, with every business that I had. But, uh, at the end of the day, like, yeah, everyone's got a great product. That's the, that's the thing, you know, everyone's got a great product. So if you're the, to sound unbiased, like if you're the business owner and you say like, okay, I'm going to give my business to, you know, one of these two guys and this one came in and he's got like, this, you know, facility, I see what they're doing. I love their involvement in the community. I uh, love the products, love the brand. And this guy's great too. He's got a great product, but you know, he's just starting out out of his garage, you know, be unbiased. Like which one are you, you know, most yeah. likely to go with? So, um, you know, you just gotta, you just gotta find those as like the garage roaster, you just gotta find those people that believe in you uh, which is what we did. Cause we started, you know, like out of the garage, like anyone else. And you got to find those people that, you know, really want to believe in you and give you a chance. Um, but yeah, eventually you want somewhere where you can control kind of like the environment, because how many times have you gone in somewhere and you're like, Hey, I'm so, you know, I'm so-and-so here's my coffee. Like, and they're like, okay, first of all, I'm busy. I'm working like, you know, yeah, you can leave it here. Someone might take it. They might bring it home. They might get thrown in the trash and might yeah. go on a back storage shelf for six months you know, um, so it really helps to be like, Hey, you know, you come on in at your convenience, you know, you want to come in day or night, we'll be here, you know, we'll drink some coffee, you know, we'll put some drinks in front of you, see what you like, see what you don't like and meet us and see if it's a good vibe for the business. And, um, yeah, it's, it's definitely, I think one of the most important parts of growing as a, as a wholesaler, you know, because otherwise, how are you going to grow your brand? Right. Exactly. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I I really like the idea that you opened up a little tasting room and stuff. That's uh when I saw that, I was like, dang, that's that's a definitely a good little move because it's like I, you're not. I didn't invent it, man. I just took that from the breweries, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's the thing because over here, like you know, in Louisiana again, it's like you don't see much going on over here like that. So it's like anytime I see something, I'm like, man, that's like that's like new and upcoming, you know. But like for y'all, it's probably all over the place over there. But so what would be your kind of like benchmarks, I guess, to go the retail route? Or is it like kind of a time frame that y'all be looking like for, for that goal, you know? Well, for like for, for proper retail, I mean, we've, we've always said again, it's like five years. Let's see. Let's see where we're at, you know? Yeah. Uh, but, but like we were saying, it was, it's always been kind of a reward. I don't know if this has been your experience too, but I've seen a lot of places or a lot of people kind of jump into that you know, it's, it's like, it's a really great idea. And again, maybe like your vision, there's like a romantic vision of like having your, yeah, or whatever, and lens out the door, God knows what, you know, a really cool space. Then you realize how much rent is. And like, you're like, how did I ever think I'd ever make any money off this? You know, yeah, so I'm not sitting there reading a book either. <laughs> and, and we've seen, we've seen examples of that. Sometimes we see, you know, we've gotten advice from friends about it. Um, and, and I think, I think the thing that we discussed was like, really it's maybe something to see as like this aspirational reward. Like it's kind of like this, this checkpoint that we hit, if we manage to make the, the grocery work and like, you know, whether it's a combination of like host, wholesale e-commerce or whatever, but really make that solid, then that's almost like how we can fund <laughs> the, the coffee shop rather than thinking of it the other way around where it might've been this fantasy of like the coffee shop's going to, you know, be this huge thing. They'll make us money. Um, and if it, then it like kind of doesn't matter also, like if, if we could get sort of the, the, the roasting side to be, um, the, the, the financial stability, then it like kind of doesn't matter if the, yeah. the coffee shop or the retail side is uh, successful, but all these things are being like examined in tandem. And there's, you know, there's always opportunities there kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier, where it's like look, we'll look at the numbers. We'll look at, you know, we've been offered to like take over places or whatever. And it's like, look, it either may, 
we'll, we'll take, we'll always look at a conversation. We'll always look at the deal. But at the end of the day, it either makes sense or it doesn't. There's only so many hours in the day. There's only so much energy you've got. It's like, is this something that's worth actually putting your energy and time into? Yes or no. It's pretty, it's a pretty clear answer, you know? Uh, and, and so far the answer has been no, but who knows, maybe there's a, there's something that starts to make sense sooner than later. And, and we look at that, but I think it's just important with that kind of stuff to just contextualize it as like this reward rather yeah. than this aspiration, rather than this expectation of like a necessary step, you know, it's like, maybe we never get there. Maybe it never really makes sense. And, and I think based off of our passions and our interests, it's not even what I would call sort of essential. It'd be really nice. But at the end of the day, Rosie likes to roast. And he's very good at roasting. And that's sort of where he's, where he's happiest. And like, yeah. it seems to be the, the, the way that we're setting ourselves apart. And, and it seems to be the lane that we've sort of fallen into. Um, and that's where we've maybe seen more of the growth happen a little bit faster uh, than even we expected to where we're looking at like, oh, this, I remember when we got the, the, the three kilogram roaster, it's like, oh man, it's going to last us like two, two and a half years or something like that. Eight months in, it's like, this isn't big enough, you know? <laughs> so like, you know, you don't know, but, but then you're like, all right, so we'll, we'll pivot accordingly. Um, you know, I don't know what your experience has been with, with, with something like that, but with retail, but I'm curious what your perspective is. Yeah, no, I think a lot of people start off with too small of a roaster. Um, Cause it is that weird stage where you go from a Beamer to, you know, two kilogram, three, three kilogram. And you're like, you're thinking this is huge, but then all of a sudden, like Matt's saying, you know, you're, you're spending hours and hours roasting. And then like what you could do in one batch, you know, you're having to take two hours to do, you know, you know, a, with, with a bunch of badges. So, yeah. And that's the other thing too. It's like all the other work to do. Cause after you sit there and roast that many batches, you got to bag it all. You got to seal it all. You got to sticker everything. And it just, takes up a lot of time so if you can have a bigger roaster yeah definitely definitely just cuts down on time where you can focus on other portions of the business so yeah. but i also but I, think, I think it depends on what your goal is too because yeah. if your goal is to have a retail and finances because like they're expensive roast, yeah it, well, exactly yeah that was, that was part yeah. two but if you're just you know a, a cafe and you want to roast your own coffee you could get you know one two kilogram just for your shop and it's a great uh oh, yeah. you know piece to have in there a great conversation piece people can see you know what you're doing in the process and but um if you're you know and that could work great but if you're trying to do you know wholesale on a bigger level or have multiple shops you're going to need a bigger piece of equipment but you're absolutely right like the price is they're all investments it's all an investment which is why you have to choose so carefully and you know, uh, I forget who said it, but it, the best way to start is with the roaster you can afford. You know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How, how like how serious are you about it? You know? Yeah. So, well, heck yeah, guys. Um, I guess real quick before we wrap it up. So, Matt, is this your full time job, or do you do other stuff too? I know I... Misha said he has other businesses and stuff. So. I... <clears throat> so you know, and, and I kind of, if I can inspire anyone who's listening, it's that. Um, it was, I was a total enthusiast, uh, bef you know, it, before we started the business. And what I love about coffee is that it is, it, you could do anything you want if you actually apply, if you're passionate about it and you apply yourself and you learn and put in the time and hours, it's like anything, you know, you're a marathon runner, right? Like yeah. I could never run a marathon, but maybe if I trained every day for, oh, you know, a year everybody and, can. and all this. Exactly. You know, well, that's what I'm saying. That's what I love about coffee is anyone, it just takes passion, you know, passion and yeah. persistence, you know, and you got to you, you want to learn and you, you've got to love like the, the science behind it, trying to dial in the perfect espresso shot or, you know, roast the perfect batch of coffee. Um, so anyone can, can really do it. It just takes putting in the time and having the dedication and the patience. Uh, so, you know, I was such an enthusiast for years while I was working, but when the pandemic hit and I lost my job, uh, I was not the kind of person to just sit around, uh, you know, and I don't want to get into a whole, you know, debate here, but, you know, a lot of people sitting around collecting unemployment, you know, that was kind of the joke is like, they're just sitting around getting paid to watch TV. And I said, well, you know, I've got this income coming in. Uh, I'm going to use that to start, you know, that time while I'm home to start this business and give it 110% and pretend like it is, you know, my full-time job. Yeah. So, you know, we kind of ran that and, uh, I still, I still dabble in production. Um, 
you know, it's, it's not too much anymore. I kind of, I'm semi-retired from, you know, from, from the road and from traveling. Cause I just love being home with my, my wife and my kid. Um, but you know, I still dabble in production, do the occasional, you know, festival work or this, that, or the other, but for the most part, yeah, this is, you know, this is full-time. Like I said, if I'm not roasting, I'm, I'm out there, you know, uh, delivering or selling or taking the cart out for events, or there's, there's never not something to do. Um, so you got to find those ways to kind of hit every, and this is the other thing I think people forget, you know, find little ways to hit every revenue source and you'll always have something going on. Yeah. So if you have a cart, you don't need to have the cart out seven days a week. That would be, you know, a full-time cart. Uh, but you know what, you could take it out on weekends and make like a little chunk of change and get out of the community, get out of the roastery. Uh, and then maybe a couple of days during the week, you're just roasting. And then one day a week, you're literally just out, you know, uh, bring coffee around, so, you know, getting involved and, and doing the sales pitch. So, um, yeah, there's always, there's never not something to do when you run your own business. And it's like, they say, I'll, I'll shut up after this, but the beauty of the business is anyone with passion, you know, and dedication can go far and succeed. So, they say, you know, if opportunity doesn't knock, build your own door. So, you know, yeah. that's my. <laughs> Heck yeah, dude. No, I definitely agree with that. And it's one of the things, I mean, uh, y'all definitely seem to have a pretty good working relationship too. Uh, there, Cause there's uh, some other partners that I've kind of met and it's like, man, I don't know. It's like, you kind of get those bad vibes. Like, but uh, yeah, y'all definitely seem to, I, I guess it's like the music stuff too. I mean, cause y'all done traveled a good bit and stuff like that before. Do, you said you do some of that still or no? Uh, I no, I kind of, um, I call it semi-retired, you know, or gotcha. retired from the road, you know, and I come out of gig retirement every once in a while, maybe for like a local show, something in LA or Orange County. But now for the most part, you know, um, like I said, there's never not something to do here. So, you know, we're, we're running this, this pretty much full time now and trying to just keep that, that slow and steady growth. Yeah, right, well, any, uh, any... Uh, we lost one of the the best tour managers on the scene. You know, it's kind uh, of worth the, kind uh, of worth the trade. But like, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm j- just quickly on your point there, like um, with, with with businesses in general and, and any sort of collaborations. I do I always say the people you work with it's probably the single most important thing. Everything else, you know, the hard work and all that's kind of a given, and maybe the more obvious thing. But but what you're talking about with partners who don't really get along or whatever. Um, I think it's super important. You're working with these people. Yeah. I knew with Rosie, I mean, we, you know, when you're on the road, you, you're living in a little sardine can together. You know, it's like, yeah. if you can, if you can, uh, if you can get along in that situation, you can pretty much get along in any situation. Right. So right. Kind of, kind of tried and true, no sleep, you know, catching flights across Europe <laughs> you know, or Australia or Asia. It's like we've been around each other when we've been real cranky and we still get along. So yeah. it was like, all right, well, we know we know that that part's good. Uh, I, you know, we knew the work, the work ethic and the talent was all there. And it's like, uh, especially on, Ro- on Rosie's and he's going to be roasting. It's like, all right, this this definitely makes sense. Um, so so if you can sort of however you can figure that out, but you know, if you can get in business with people that you genuinely get along with and that you could say, yes, we're on the same wavelength. We're not going to be arguing about basic stuff yeah. or stupid or you're butting yeah. heads over stupid things. And it's like big picture. One, one little exercise, which I think is useful. Uh, and this can be entirely internal, but try to drop like a mission statement or like a uh, story of the company or something. You just have a Google doc or something to reference can be useful uh, down the line if you're trying to make decisions or as you get bigger, you might lose sight of it. You know, you might forget, Hey, it's supposed to be fun. <laughs> you know, yeah, <laughs> like, you like exactly. and you can have these, these, these aspects or, or things that kind of help you uh, that, that sometimes can, can, can hurt your vision or, or opportunities that actually are not in line with your core values. But if you're able to get that sort of document together, and again, this is something that's internal, but, but it's good to reference uh, internally is, you know, you can make sure that you are on that same wavelength. You should be coming to that same story, the, the core ethics and morals and values and, and mission statement. If you can get that together and it's like, yeah, we're on the same page, you're probably going to be fine. And if you're not on the same page, you'll find out pretty early on, yeah. uh, and maybe save yourself a little bit of trouble. Cause I, I think that's one of the most important things when sort of going into the business is working with people that you genuinely, you know, respect uh, I mean, I, lo- I love this dude here. He's one of my favorite people on the planet. So like, I, I knew that was not going to be an issue. Um, but yeah, that'd be my little bit of advice on that. Heck yeah. That's some yeah. solid advice, dude. Everybody needs a mission in their life. 
<laughs> what's your favorite uh, coffee? I won't go Misha? that far. But <laughs> let's wrap it up. What, what's your favorite coffee, Misha? Favorite coffee? Yeah. Oh, oh man. Pick one right now. Um, oh, the, for, for what kind of preparation? Oh, anything you want. If you had one coffee to drink for the rest of your life right now. Like, like, like region or st- everything. I, I, yeah. Region. I love, yeah, I love region, flatty, origin. I love flatty and oh man. I um, I have I'm, to say ours either. <laughs> no, but you know what? That, that I've been, I've been really on that uh, double negative kick, man. Oh, right, right, right. And yeah. it's so not what I like for pour over is the thing. Yeah. Cause for pour over, dude, that carbonic macerated natural, which totally sounds like a death metal band name <laughs> have y'all been have y'all been experimenting with those or yeah, so we we bounce around and if you you know anyone who who checks out our selection or our coffee like um you know we kind of have you know i always joke that like coffee is for everyone you know but we do try to have you know certain uh origins that might be a little more adventurous but we have stuff that might be a little more approachable to some drinkers and you know, we kind of do want to have something for everyone. So yeah, you can, you know, try our, our, our carbonic macerated, you know, Colombian, uh, or you can just try our, our very uh, different, but equally as good approachable natural Brazil, you know, <laughs> I hear you. so there's like a little, you know, there's something for everyone. We don't, you know, uh, uh, subscribe to any sort of, you know, one's kind of style of roasting we kind of let the coffee speak and we kind of like to have a, a nice uh versatile you know um assortment of coffees to pick from so yeah. you know because not you know not to sound stupid or anything but because we drink so much different kinds of coffee you know there's uh they say every home has a coffee and every coffee has a home and i like to fill my home with lots of different coffees so i do too it'd be, it'd be I'm really hard to just heard about them. it Oh yeah. yeah. And I will drink. Yeah. I could find like the beauty in so many different, I'm not like, I only drink naturals or, you know, yeah. <laughs> uh, like I could find the beauty in so many different coffees, so many different origins. And that's part of the fun, um, you know, in, in drinking it is trying something different, you know, whether it's a, like a light roasted, uh, you know, Yerga chef or like a, a nice deeply roasted, um, you know, uh, Sumatra, there's, there's something cool and interesting to pick out of each one. Yeah. So Matt, if you had to choose no one, if you had to choose <laughs> one, saying that now, if you, you got to pick one right now, uh, I can't, that's always my answer. It's my cop-out answer, man. I can't. <laughs> no, uh, what have you been drinking lately? Um, I, I really, really love everything. Uh, we've worked with, um, a farm in Costa Rica, uh, Sonora farms, check them out on Google, just Google Sonora farms on there. Uh, but they always, always put out some consistently over the top, uh, delicious coffees. So, uh, we have a couple of bags, you know, they only release a certain amount, uh, a year of, you know, uh, a select few that we like. So I make sure to get them up and, and I've really been liking, um, you know, what they're, they're putting out in terms of their honey and natural processed. Yeah, but I also the know, honey I, is serious. Oh, that's, that's good stuff, man. That might, that might actually... Is that my favorite? That might be my, I don't know. Yeah. There's changes all the time. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, yeah. There's changes all you know the time. Like, really good. You know, what was incredible was version two of, uh, of Northern lights. Oh uh, yeah. So we're, we're giant espresso nerds as well. So we spend uh, more time than we probably should <clears throat> roasting different, experimenting with different espresso roasts and, and uh, you know, and just pulling shots literally uh, like for hours, just pulling shots to, to taste and, you know, just kind of putting in that preparation for it. So. Yeah, I've been wanting to get more into that uh that area too with the espresso and stuff. So, shoot, dude, I'm yeah. uh, I'm gonna try to be out there. I think in maybe for Thanksgiving or something this year. So yeah, come down and do. see us. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. my wife she she lives right there and well not lives but she uh, grew up right there in L.A. So she's got family out there. So I'll send you a bottle. What do you uh what do you brewing or brew methods are you using these days? Right now, I do got a little uh. It's like, a, I forget what the name of the little espresso machine. It's one of like the little four or $500 espresso machines. I've been like just experimenting with, you know, but honestly just uh V60 filter brew. And then um, you I seem like, like a Chemex fan. Yeah. Chem, I, I like Chemex. I like the mocha pot. I like, you know, kind yeah. of all, all of the little, you know, 
I ain't too much on the French press anymore, but that was kind of one of the first things that ever even got me into coffee, you know? Yeah, yeah, so, me too. It's like a good I, level because everyone knows French press. Oh, you know? yeah, yeah. And anyone can go. That's what I love. Anyone can go to Target and get a Bodum, like, $8 French press yeah. and get their coffee going, you yeah, know? Yeah, and you can't, yeah. you can't mess up a French press, you know? Yeah, it's like no. <laughs> super hard to mess up a French press, but... I find I switch. I went for, like, a good solid year of just... I thought Chemex was, like, the... Sh- can I swear on yeah, that? Yeah, I did, I did oh, too. Oh yeah. man, I thought Chemex was like the end all be uh, I was yeah. like, this is awesome. I used it for a year straight. And now I'm on the V6, you know, on the V60 kick as well. And yeah, like it's kind of, you know, you switch it up on what's it's just easy. You know, it's it's yeah. easy. Yeah. On a big V60 kick, big V60 kick by yeah. Oh That's yeah, you know that Kalita, I was on Kalita Wave for a while. Yeah. Wave, you like Clever Dripper too. And I oh I was on Clever Dripper, just so it was so easy. Yeah. But yeah. now I'm big on V60. Big on yeah. V60. I and tried to get to the Gabby, Gabby Brewer for a while, and it was, it's, um, oh, that's the one with all the pieces. The yeah. Lego. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I, yeah, this sounds bad. I might get, you know, hate for this, but it's too many pieces, man. Like, you know, assemble like a gadget to brew your coffee. Like, give me one thing. That's why I love Chemex. That's the yeah. thing, you know, give me the thing yeah. and the filter. Yeah. I don't want to build like a tower to get my coffee, you know? <laughs> Heck yeah. Well, guys, look, I appreciate y'all coming on, and it was a, it was a fun episode, and I, I definitely learned a lot from y'all. And, um, yeah, I want to come out there and see y'all's little operation whenever I come yeah, out. There. Absolutely, yeah, that'd be yeah, great. To meet y'all. Maybe we can we can do another little version too without all oh, the cuts. Oh, we could do a lot, oh, so. the live version. Dude. That'd be great. Huh? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I definitely would love to dude, do that. So. Yeah, yeah, and we want to see. Uh, I hope to see a new uh, updated. I gotta say, I love your last video on your update on the the space. You know, I love how tr- how open you are and trade because a lot of people would be like, kind of, um, I don't know, like hesitant to give like publicly give up like that yeah, actually i was really hesitant about <laughs> no but dude, people need that like people yeah, that's what i was thinking too you uh, know? to know like the realities of it you know because otherwise how you know like that's you are the guide to a lot of people like i said when i first started watching you know a bunch of content you were one of the the first like i think you know you were one of the first people I, your cupping video is still one of the best ones out there you know yeah but, i just uh, try to make yeah. it super simple yeah, and that's, yeah, but that's, there's a couple of you guys like, man, there's another roaster up in Washington and like he hit me up a while back around 2022 and like he is he's got a 120 kilogram machine now it's he's he's booming and it's like, yeah. I was talking to him the other day and he's like, you got me into this and I'm like, how are y'all moving so fast, you know, but of course he's like it, in his 50s is, and he's got business day, experience and it is it's at the end of the day it's a sales driven business man. Oh, yeah, like, you can be as passionate as you want, but if you're not like out there, you know, showing why you're, you know, you're great and your product's great, then yeah, I always say, and this is, you know, harsh, but do you want a really, when people ask about like getting into roasting or coffee in general, I say, okay, with roasting, do you, do you want a really cool hobby or do you want to actually have a go to business because yeah. they're two very different things, you know? Um, so there's a lot that goes into having a functional business that a lot of people don't know about. They just think like, Oh yeah, if I roast coffee, then like everyone will come by. Like like people will just magically show up and be oh, like, yeah. like two hundred pounds of coffee, please roast yeah. it and they will come. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. it's tough, man. And it, you know, there's I have so much respect for the other roasters in our area that have you know been around longer than us and just are such masters of their craft. Um, but like I said, you know, there's there's always room, man. There's always room for for others to come in the market, and you know, the ones that are dedicated are you know dedicated and persistent are going to be the ones that are around uh for years heck yeah heck yeah i like that dude uh i'll definitely link all your stuff below i'll link uh thanks man uh, i'll definitely send you a big box of coffee yeah (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, i don't i don't know i don't turn down coffee yeah but uh what what i'll tell you though if you're if you're ever feeling um kind of kind of weird being a little precious with some of the stuff or like how the sausage is made or any of the the educational stuff i I used to be that way especially like music you know you get presets how you dial things in or whatever and then with businesses it was sometimes like man is this a secret is this like you know and uh, one thing I learned, and I learned this from people who are way more successful than me uh, in business and whatever, people I know who are the most successful in business are the ones who are the most willing to tell you everything. I was like, oh my God, you're just telling me all the secrets. Like, yeah, like, I don't care. Because they realize yeah. like the application of the stuff, it's not, it's not just the knowledge, the application, it's the work, it's everything else. But then it is good to share and it does create that sense of community or whatever. So what you're doing is great, man. It's like, I wouldn't, I would never feel nervous about 
sharing that stuff, you're never actually going to be giving away the secret because yeah. it's you. At the end of the day, it's you, and you can't give you away as much as you may try. Oh, but yeah. what you can do is, you know, by, by being open with all that stuff and, and being transparent with all that stuff, it does make people feel like, oh, you know, here's, here's a guy I can trust and here's someone I can work with, helps you down the line. Well, and it creates I'm that, sure that, a lot that, of them can relate too, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. And that's kind of the thing too, I guess why I kind of released it as well is like, I don't know, just share the story. A lot of times, you know, you get on Instagram and everything's just, everybody's winning, nobody's yeah. losing and everybody's product just looks amazing. Your right. testing lab is already <laughs> open and you've got like hundreds of people outside, you know, cause like everything looks great on Instagram and stuff, you know, and you uh, just, I, I, social yeah. media, man, is like, uh, what I've learned is that it's a whole world that like, I don't fully understand. And Dude, so much, does. you know, there's documentaries now about how it's all smoke and mirrors, man. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I, I'm not saying to, to, to fake it or do any of that stuff. I have good content and be original. And yeah. we all know, and you know, because you're doing it, it's about you, man. Like people don't really uh, love like corporations or brands. They love like the people behind right. them, you know? So uh, you know, it's about you. You're selling yourself and you just keep keep doing it, man. You know? Heck yeah. Well, I appreciate that. I thank y'all for the encouragement. That's, uh, of course, man. That's, That's nice. Nice. <laughs> I know. Everything you said in the last one, I was like, yeah, I've been there. Oh, we've been there. <laughs> yeah, oh, we've been there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Definitely some hard conversations. Yeah. So, well, heck yeah, guys. No, I truly appreciate y'all getting on. And uh, again, I, I want to come meet y'all in person here pretty soon. So, yeah. if I'm out there this fall, I'll definitely we'll hit y'all up. So, let us know. That'd be fun, yeah. man. All right, y'all take it easy. You guys have a good night. Later, Matt. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for tuning into the Coffee Runs Deep podcast. I truly hope you enjoyed this episode, and I can't thank Matt and Misha enough for taking the time and recording an episode with me. Their IG and website will be linked below, so please visit and support their journey. If you would like to help support these episodes, you can click on the Patreon link below. Thanks to the patrons that already support. I truly appreciate the help. Thanks again for tuning in, and I will see you next week.